Hello everybody, and um, once again, this is Justin Potrelli of the Living Sword Ministries. Yes, it is one of those videos as I get comfortable in my in my bed here, trying to get the light just right because it's it's nighttime, it's dark, you know, got like two lamps on. One lamp lamp is like right in my face. It's like, uh, <laughs> but if I don't have it on, then there's not gonna be any light for you guys to see me with. It'll kind of look like this, you know, like that. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna turn this off soon anyway, so then I'll probably just dim my lamp. Um, so just a quick FYI, yes, it is one of those videos where I give a little sermon. Do a little preaching. Um, because basically if if you're a Christian and if you're not ashamed of your own own faith and your beliefs, then you really need to share them. Especially if you're convinced that you have the truth. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, the topic is about mercy, okay, and it's actually a very important topic in the Bible. Um, at least for a few reasons, okay. So, um, and yeah, I have a little bit of a a personal interest in this topic right now but that that's my own business my own reasoning um but when i think about it when i thought about it this verse came to me mercy triumphs over judgment okay so I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to close the camera here so I can put a lamp on my, or a, a shade back on my lamp. Then I'm going to take this off so it'll overheat. I'll be right back. Just bear with me. You can sit here and uh, read some verses, okay? There we go. Close that. Oh, wrong button. Let's try that again. There we go. Take off my shirt. And I'll put the lamp shade back on the lamp. Okay. That's a lot better. Mine are kind of like burning right now, so uh, just a quick FYI, just for fun, as like some background. Um, I was playing um, that new um, Android game off the Play St off the Play Store, off Google Play, called Among Us. For at least, I don't know, <laughs> has it been six hours? I'm not sure. Too long, for too long right now. Initially, my um, reaction was positive to it, but I'm starting to realize it's it's not for me. Okay. Um, and that's, that's not why I'm doing this video, just to let you guys know, I'm just doing old man rambling right now. That's all this is. Okay. So I, I get into one game. You basically get into the lobby, waiting for people to, uh, um, to basically have the game start up. Okay. You can customize your character. You can pick, like, hats and stuff. 
So supposedly it was, you know, someone's birthday. And he says everyone put on birthday hats. Now, I could have just said fine, no problem, I could have done it. But I stayed quiet. And I stuck with my uh, bandana. Okay. So here I am. Waiting for the guy to start the game. I got my, my bandana on. And I realize he is still flooding the chat with with his demands. Now he's demanding that people put on their party hats. It's like, a, like I said, again, you can literally go in before the game starts, customize your character, and pick different hats to put on your head. Okay. Basically, these characters look like really messed up versions of minions. You know, except with hats. Okay. So eventually the guy has a hissy fit and just leaves the game. So I'm like, that's that's great. I'm thinking there's, there's so much craziness involved with such a simple game. You wouldn't think it would be so crazy, but it, it gets bad. Okay. So... A guy like me who wants to be low stress, it's probably not going to be a game I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stick with it, probably. I mean, it's fun for a quick romp, especially if you're new to the game and want to try something different, then I recommend it, but after that, no, I... If you don't want a quick romp, then don't play it. It's not going to be for you guys. It's not. Okay. I mean, so now on to our actual purpose of the video. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Okay. So right now I'm on Bible info, or sorry, openbible.info. And typically it's easy to get to this um, website because all you got to do sometimes is go to Google, type in... Um, topic followed by the word verses. So maybe judgment verses. And this website might come up in the search results. Okay. Okay, that didn't need to be shown, but anyway. Okay, that's an ad. We're going to pretend that wasn't there, right? Okay, great. So, um... Is let me quickly get out my hand Bible, okay? And then I'll be right back. Now I know that, um, this topic will probably make very little sense without me giving giving my reasoning for it. Again, suffice to say, it's a very personal issue, which I'm not ready to divulge. Okay. But this is a topic that anyone can benefit from, whether you are a Christian or a non-Christian, okay? And yes, this will also relate back to Christian universal salvation, okay? And it's going to be pretty easy to see why eventually at some point, okay? So, I don't need to prove universal salvation through Christ with just simple um, technical strategies. You know, I can just be very technical. I can do word studies and prove it. But I think it's more effective to prove it topically through topics, okay, like this one. So here's the verse. Let's go to James 2.13. I know it's right there, but I'm going to open up the uh, the King James 
and read it that way first. And guys, I don't have any notes, so I'm kind of doing this just off the top of my head, which doesn't help at all. But that's how it goes sometimes. And of course, um, I should really be using my camera for this, I suppose. But, um, I think this will be good enough. I've got a little headache. I just ate, and I just took my meds, and I'm trying to catch up on my drinking water. So, hopefully my headache goes away. It's probably either I'm dehydrated, haven't had enough to eat, or sometimes a headache can be the beginning of a series of symptoms which points to a possible seizure. Um, but I've taken my meds, I've eaten some food just recently, so it should go down any time now. <laughs> James 2.13 In the King James for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. Now you might be thinking, what in the world does that mean? Now guys, obviously the ESV, the English Standard Version, makes it a lot more clear. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now you might think to yourself, well, what does that mean exactly? Well, so we know in the Bible there is going to be a judgment. Okay? In Revelation, it's basically known as the great white throne of judgment event. All right? And generally speaking, that's when Christ basically, you could argue, has you in front of him and says, okay, let's, uh, let's check out the scoreboard, more or less, right? That's the gist of it. So, What happens if we have not shown people mercy in our lives? Simple. We will not be shown mercy. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, you're taking that out of context. James 2 is a relatively... Big chapter at 26 verses. Certainly you're taking that out of context. Well, let's take a look real quick. What else do we have here? Now, um, John 8. That's pretty good, actually. Let's go to John 8. Now, guys, once again, I'm simply reading at random here. I have no real reading plan right now. I have no notes. This is kind of unplanned. So I'm doing this on the fly. Let's go to John chapter 8. Now, I know you could just read it off this thing here, but, you know, huh. I'm not doing it that way. Now, um, let's see here. In my Bible, the chapter is certain is simply labeled the adulterous woman, Jesus the light. 
Now this thing says 1 through 59. But that is literally the entire chapter. <laughs> so we're going to try to cut that short, shall we? I'm going to try to find the uh, latest place to start off. We'll just start reading from verse 1. <laughs> Sorry. James chapter 8, verse 1, and moving forward. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the mist, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. So what's going on? They caught her being adulterous. She's obviously a married woman, and she, you know, there you go, right? She was doing the do with someone else, and they, they bust her for it. So, what does the law technically say in this case? Back in the day, what did it say? What did they believe had to be done? Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what does you what do you say? But what do you say? Okay. Now what does it mean, be stoned? You literally throw rocks at the person until they die. More or less, that's it. Okay? You chuck rocks at them until they die. Now, maybe not to death, maybe, but... Still, right? That sounds kind of brutal. Verse 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he had not heard them. Now, guys, I'm taking some liberties with the reading because the King James doesn't always read very nicely. Or more specifically, it's very difficult reading at times. Okay. So I should probably get a newer version and read from it, but I like the classics. What can I say? Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. Okay. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman woman was standing in the midst. Now guys, so here, real simple. I've had people tell me, you know, when I've asked them the question, then why didn't they throw rocks at her? Why didn't Jesus throw rocks at her? According to the law, according to what he had just said, if he is in fact God, which I believe he is, According to their law, he could have chucked any number of rocks at this woman for sinning. Okay? Especially, you know, right? Um, he that is without sin, let him first cast a stone at her. Right? Now, I know we're getting into some technical aspects of this passage. Okay? But that's just some food for thought, just something to think about. So what happens now, right? What happens now? So, the people that heard this, convicted by their own conscience, one out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left, was left alone with the woman, Right? None of them threw a rock at her at all, period. 
Now people will say, maybe he meant, if you've committed adultery, you can't throw a rock. So are we, are we being told then that this entire crowd was made up of adulterers? I don't think so. Sin. Without sin. Period. Everybody sins. Period. That's why no one chucked a rock. Because they knew, according to Christ, they had no right to do so. But their law said otherwise, though. So let's keep going here. Verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Okay. Go and sin no more. Now, you could continue... Okay, after verse 10, or I'm sorry, after verse 11, and go all throughout the entire passage, or the entire chapter, and probably get a lot more out of this, okay? But this whole thing goes along with the concept of blessed, sorry, <laughs> mercy triumphs over judgment, okay? Okay. This is about Christ himself, about God himself not being a hypocrite. It's not as if the woman was not guilty of, um, of adultery. That much is clear. She's been caught in the act. Okay. This also goes along with the concept of um, love keeps no record of wrongs. That's, I believe, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 within like the first 10 verses or so, okay? Depending on the wording of the uh, version of the Bible you're reading, okay? The general idea is that love keeps no record of wrongs, okay? And of course, for God's love the world, okay, that he gave his only begotten son, okay? So since God is love, we know this is how Christ acts, because Christ is God, and God is love. And God is obviously not a hypocrite. Okay. So what does he do here? What does he do? He shows this woman mercy. Okay. And only by convicting everyone else, getting to their conscience, is he able to basically force them to show mercy to her. Okay? Now you go back to James 2.13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. So what's going to happen? You will be judged according to how you have judged others in life. If you are not merciful, you will not be shown any mercy. It's as simple as that. Um, let's see here. What else can we do for you? And let's go ahead and prove that right now. Let's go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 7. Guys, this stuff right here is actually part of the famous Sermon on the Mount that Christ gives. And I'll go ahead and read out of the first um, five verses of chapter 7, just like it suggests here. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what me measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Okay. 
And I'll explain all this in a couple moments, okay? And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of your own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. All right. Is this out of context? No. Read the rest of the chapter, okay? It's about the golden rule. Chapter 7, according to my notes right here in the Bible itself, it says, The golden rule, two ways, two foundations. Okay? The rest of the chapter, as far as I'm, I'm aware, only reinforces what the first five verses are saying. We know, according to the Bible, that everyone sins. According to 1 John, I believe, chapter 1, we know clearly that everyone sins, and that if they say they have no sin, they're lying. Okay? I've gone over that before, probably many times now. So, let's read from the ESV real quick. Judge not, that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, will be measured to you. So now what's all this about the speck in the eye and the beam in the eye? Okay, so... Let's say I find fault with someone, you know, and maybe I'm upset with somebody for, I don't know, whatever reason, right? So basically that that's the speck. So I go to someone and say, man, you're messed up. You have you're you're all wrong. You're you're a bad person. But what Christ is saying, first, I need to take a good hard long look at myself and realize I'm no better than the guy that I'm casting judgment upon. Okay? According to the Bible, I'm a sinner too. According to God, I'm a sinner too. So if I go around casting judgment upon others, guess what's going to happen to me? I will be judged by that same measurement. If I go around judging everyone that's wronged me, when it comes time for, for me to be judged, guess what? I'll be judged I'll be judged just as sorry, just as harshly. So God's not saying clean up your act and then you get to judge people. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying realize first that you are not the perfect person you think you are or the good person you think you are, and then you'll see clearly enough to not judge your brother in the first place because you'll stop seeing him as someone lowly and, and, and worse than you and just start seeing him as a person who is just as messed up as you are, and is in his need and uh, sorry, and just as much in need of mercy as you are. Okay. Well, people will say, but it says in John seven twenty four, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Well, guys, first of all, you need to define what right judgment happens to be, okay? And I believe the context of the Bible in general tells you what right judgment is. Right judgment, and this is might just be my opinion, I could be wrong, look it up, decide for yourselves. Right judgment says 
do not go around believing that you have the right to play the role of God. I have no right to go around and say, well, so-and-so is bad, you know, and that person is bad, and that person is bad, and therefore I get to put them down or be nasty towards them, you know. No. Right judgment is, I'm no better than them. I have no right to play God and tell them that they're bad or evil. All right? What else do we got, guys? Let's take a look. Here's something fun. I haven't seen this before. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4, 16, I guess. Let's see what that's about. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Wow, check that out. And that's the end of a chapter right there. So that's important right there. That's an important thing to hear. So, if we have treated others mercifully, you can bet anything that when the time comes, we will be shown mercy. So, and just in case someone wants to say, oh, you're taking all this out of context, okay? You're taking it all, all, you're taking it all out of context. Go to Matthew chapter 5 first. Matthew chapter 5. This is the beginning. This is the beginning of of Christ's very famous Sermon on the Mount. It starts in chapter 5, and it moves on for, I think, about three chapters. Okay. Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. In other versions of, of the Bible, it says, Happy are the merciful. Okay, blessed or happy. Both are acceptable translations of that, of the Greek. Okay. This is Christ, guys. If you have a red letter Bible, okay, I definitely recommend a red letter Bible because it helps you to find what Christ is saying. Okay. And if you understand or accept that Christ is God, then you're going to realize this is God himself speaking, trying to tell you something important. Okay? So there's no taking this stuff out of context. There's no taking James 2.13 out of context. Okay? There's no taking John chapter 8, the woman in adultery, out of context. Okay? John chapter 8 is not Christ um, making an exception for someone. Okay? The woman caught in adultery was not an exception. The thief on the cross was not an exception. They are the rules. They are the rules. God does not change. God does not change. I cannot repeat that enough. These people... The thief next to Christ on the cross, the woman caught in adultery, these are not exceptions. These are the rules. This is Christ following his own teachings. This is God teaching, and this is God doing what he's teaching. Again, blessed are the merciful for they 
shall obtain or receive mercy. Okay, it's as simple as that. So now, let's get to the part where I relate this back to Christian universal salvation. So people might say to you, well, then maybe there's levels of eternal torture. So maybe if you go to level 10, you'll be beaten every minute by a demon, and you'll be forced to watch, you know, the worst presidential debates for the rest of history. And you'll be forced to eat, you know, nasty fecal matter for breakfast. And fire ants will, you know, roast your genitalia for all eternity, constantly. But maybe mercy really means on level one, you'll just go to level one of eternal torture, right? And maybe you'll only be beaten, like, I don't know, for a couple minutes out of every day. And only have to eat, you know hot feces for, like, I don't know, one meal per day, and maybe you'll only be, I don't know, verbally assaulted, like, I don't know, um, for an hour out of every day. And that's your mercy. You're still tortured forever, but just not all the time forever. <laughs> it's like, no, no, guys. That is not mercy. That's not what that means. Okay, what does mercy mean in the context of John chapter 8? He doesn't berate her. He doesn't attack the woman. He doesn't say, you wicked, evil, sinful person, yes guys, chuck stones at her. What does he do? He lets her walk with nothing more than a simple command, go and sin no more. That is mercy. Okay, you can also go to the uh, the parable of the um, unmerciful servant, and you can read how the king lets the, the debtor go. But when the debtor, who is also owed money, decides not to be merciful to his to his guy that owes him money, the king immediately changes his mind and says, Okay, well, you weren't going to be nice to that guy, so why should I be nice to you? Mercy is giving someone grace. Grace is something that you don't have to earn. It's just given to you as a gift. Okay? That's what it is. That's what Christ gave us on the cross. He gave us grace. He gave us something we didn't earn or deserve. It's simply a gift. That's what mercy is. Mercy triumphs over judgment. According to James 2.13, Christ teaches that you'll receive mercy if you're merciful. Okay? John chapter 8 is about God himself following his own rules. Letting this woman walk when old school Mosaic law told these people to basically beat her to death. Matthew chapter 7 teaches us to look at ourselves very carefully before we cast judgment so that we may realize that we're just as messed up as the people that we are trying to judge. John chapter 7 verse 24 is not about God saying it's okay to judge people. Okay? So if you look at the greater context of the Bible, that's not what it's about at all. Righteous judgment is about first realizing that you're also a sinner, that you're no better than the person you're judging. And if you follow the golden rule, okay, that comes basically from the Bible itself, you'll understand 
to be merciful to that person that you wanted to judge. What else do we got? Probably not much else. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I think I'm going to quickly go to my favorite verse in Revelations. Or maybe a couple of them first. <laughs> Let me see if I can find them first, shall we? Revelation 3.19 As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Who does Christ love? Who does God love? John 3.16 Everyone. He loves everyone. He's asking everyone to be zealous and repent. He rebukes and chastens everyone because he loves everyone. The gospel of salvation is inclusive to every man. Okay. As we can find out, I think it's in 1 Timothy. Okay. For Christ is the Savior of all mankind, especially of those that believe. Okay. The Bible also tells us very clearly, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. Mercy is not about beating someone eternally. I don't care if you beat them, you know, once a second or once a day. That's not merciful if you beat them eternally. Okay? There's a difference between torment for the sake of tormenting them and torment or punishment for the sake of correction. There's a difference. People want to point out, well, what about Matthew, where it talks about, and these will be sent off to eternal punishment. Guys, the Greek word there is actually better understood as a type of corrective punishment. If you never get out of jail, you're not being corrected. Okay? If you're going to be corrected, eventually you're going to leave jail because now you've been corrected and can re-enter society. That's the type of punishment that's being spoken of in that specific chapter in Matthew, in the book of Matthew. I don't know it offhand at the moment. I could look it up, but I don't, I don't want to, so I'm not going to. Okay, but the one that talks about these will go into eternal life and these into eternal punishment. It's about a corrective punishment. Corrective. Okay. So yes, God does rebuke and chasten those he loves. But that is for the purpose of correction to get people to come to a point. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah, it says, and when God's punishments, or sorry, judgments, are in the earth, the people will learn righteousness. And if you're learning righteousness via God's judgments or corrections, then guess what happens once you've learned righteousness? You're going to follow God. And that's why we have the following verse in Revelation chapter 21. Um, 21. Nope, sorry. 22. <laughs> 22, 17. 
you guys have probably heard me say this like a bazillion times, but I'm going to say it until you guys get sick of it. Revelation 22, 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Guys, let's back the truck up real quick. What is or who is the water of life? Christ is. That is proven very easily in many passages. Okay. Who could possibly be a thirst after the great white throne of judgment event? Only those. Only those that are without Christ. Only those that are in the lake of fire could possibly be thirsty at this point. And what makes me think this verse was written to people and directed at people that are in the lake of fire? Because the bride, the church, is only referred to as the bride after after the wedding of the church to Christ. This is a post-rapture event. Okay? Revelation chapter 22, 17 happens very clearly after people are in the lake of fire. Okay? After. Read Revelation. Even in context, it's very easy. Look at chapter Revelation 22, verse 15. For without... For without are dogs and sorcerers, whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Okay, we're talking about people outside the kingdom of heaven and those that are inside. So what's verse 17? What is verse 17 being directed at? Who's the audience? The audience are those that are outside the city. They're outside the kingdom of God. The dogs, the sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, the liars. Okay? You can basically directly compare uh, 22, or, sorry, 2215 to another verse who talks about everyone who will be in the lake of fire. Okay? All liars are mentioned in that very same verse. Just like in chapter 22, 15. So who do you think 22, 17 is being directed at? Because according to the Bible, you will eventually be with God. Because God loves you, and he's not going to stop until you decide that you want to be with him out of your own free will. And he has the power and will and intelligence to make it happen. Guys, just read about what happened to um, Saul, right? Saul, before he became known as Paul. Read about the Damascus Road Conversion. People say, well, you know, God can make exceptions. Maybe God forced him to convert. No. God doesn't make exceptions. God is the same today, yay, and forever, and yesterday, and all that kind of fun stuff. He never changes. If you believe God doesn't force people to do, to do anything, then he never does. He didn't force Paul to do anything. 
Paul converted out of his own free will because he, he obviously suddenly realized the truth and realized, and realized that God loved him. Realized there was a God that loved him. And then he willingly converts. God loves everyone. He wants everyone. He won't stop. Yes, you might receive correction and rebuke, chastisement, whatever you want to call it. But in the end, God's purposes, his judgments, lead you to righteousness. And in the end of Revelation 22.17, the door is always open to drink from the water of life, which is Christ. Okay? So, going back to our main point, though, in the meantime, whether you are a Christian or a non-Christian, a believer or a non-believer, okay? Remember, for judgment is without mercy to one who shows no mercy. Mercy will triumph over judgment. Blessed are the merciful, for they receive mercy. Okay? Judge not, that you be not judged. For with the judgment that you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. What is grace? Unwarranted favor. Unwarranted, unearned. It's a gift. We've been given the gift of grace from Christ. We need to share that gift with others. The gift of grace. The gift of, the gift of mercy. I hope this has made sense to everyone who listens. Because even people like me that can act like a total jerk sometimes, because I, I know I can be, I know I've been a total jerk at times to people, even idiots like me need to remember this lesson and need to apply it in our lives. And to be fair, yes, there is someone... in my life that needs to learn this lesson. And that's the only clue you're going to get. Okay, guys. We'll do the outro properly, okay? One second. There we go. That's better. I know, no more light. That's how about some I'll lean down like that. What do you think? What do you guys think? Not bad, right? Because as always, you know what to do. Please leave any questions, comments, or constructive criticism down in the comments below. If you don't like the video, please give it a thumbs down, then explain to me why. I'll be more than happy to listen. If you don't like preaching, by the way, don't watch, don't listen. But if you're willing to learn with an open mind, willing to give God a chance, please review the video if you want to, again and again. Okay? Because once you realize what Christ, Christ is God, and that what God is really about, realize what he really is about, then you will understand that he is a loving God, 
so real quick, let's just let's just tackle a quick issue real real fast before I close. So you may say, okay, he's a loving God. Why do good things happen? To, or sorry, why do bad things happen to good people? Because God never promises us a free, happy ride. That's not what this is all about. Because the problem is sin. And the consequence of sin is death. Okay? God didn't put us here to to give us a ticket out of trouble. The trouble is here for a reason. To teach us. To help us. To force us even to spiritually grow and learn. You don't learn and grow if there's no test. Think about that for, for a moment. Let's say you went to school and were never tested, were never made to do homework. How do we know you're ever going? How, how do we know you're learning? How do you know if you learned anything if you're never tested? How do you know? How do you know if you're learning the material if you never do the homework? This is work, guys. Life is work. Okay? This ain't no free ride. No free lunch. It's not. Okay? Yeah. Life can be painful. It's part of learning. That's how we learn. That's all there is to it. Virus 2020. Wash your hands. <laughs> okay? <sighs> Please leave a dislike in the video, in the comments, and sorry to... <laughs> Please leave a dislike below. Don't forget not to subscribe to my channel. And, um, have a great day. Seriously. Peace.